Do you think maybe one of the reasons why in philosophy it's not as easily, uh, it's not as easy to be buffaloed is because there is this large society for Christian philosophers where you can find community um, with other Christian philosophers. Uh, do, do you think, the, each of you were involved in the founding of the Society for Christian Philosophers years ago. Do you think that has played a role in creating space for Christian philosophical thinkers to be uh, uh, expressly Christian in their yeah. philosophizing? Well, I'm pretty sure that it has. It certainly is true that now there is much more such space than there was when, the, when, this, uh, when the society began. And undoubtedly, the society has played some role in that. Uh, but it, it is also true if you, if you go back to that time, back to the time when Nick and I were in grad school, for example, there weren't very many, there, there wasn't any project of Christian philosophy. Catholics were doing their thing, but there wasn't any connection between what they were doing and what went on in the rest of the philosophical world. And in the rest of the philosophical world, there were Christians at places like Calvin College and Wheaton and some in other and many other places as well. But they were, for the most part, uh, very low profile. For example, one of my teachers was uh, William K. Frankena. I mean, people you know that come from Friesland have names like Jalama, Frankena, Planninga, Pausinga, Hoytinga, et cetera. This is Frankena. And uh, he was a member of the Christian Reformed Church, a graduate of Calvin College, came to the uh, campus chapel on Sunday and the like, considered himself a Christian. But you wouldn't be able to tell it from his work at all. There wasn't any, he never, never addressed any questions that had anything specific to do with Christian belief or anything of the sort. Um, and, and partly the reason was it just wasn't a done thing. I remember also a conversation with, uh, with uh, Roderick Chisholm and uh, Norman Malcolm. And Norman Malcolm became a, became a Christian. Uh, and at the time of this conversation, he was sort of in process. And Roderick Chisholm never became a Christian, but he had leanings toward theism. And we three were talking about these things, and, and they, they said that uh, they were really glad that they said this sort of thing has to be kept under our hats. I mean, if it gets out that we think this way, things will things will uh, things won't go well. You know, now that doesn't that sort of thing wouldn't happen anymore. So I think the society played a significant role, the Society for Christian Philosophers, but almost simultaneously, maybe a little bit before, I think some important things happened within philosophy in general. And that is the, uh, the death of what I've sometimes called the policing function. When I was in grad school, when, when Al and I were in grad school, positivism was still, well, it was actually near death, but it seemed to be in its heyday. And the pos positivism was a sort of policing function. It, it, it w w went around through philosophy and said, well, that sentence has no meaning, that sentence does, that sentence has no meaning, and so forth. And in particular, sentences of metaphysics and of theology were, by the canon of the positivists, meaningless. And so it had this profound, well, cop, function like a cop. You, you're, you're, you're not saying any, you're just uttering sentences. You're not saying anything. And then shortly after that, the brief life of Oxford ordinary language philosophy, which consisted of chastising people by saying, but one wouldn't say that. And of course, and by one wouldn't say that, they meant an ordinary speaker of the English language would not say that. And by that criterion, probably most of philosophy cons consists of things that one would not say. Um, both of those died a uh, sudden death in the 60s. And that opened up the field. And there's a little bit of policing in philosophy. Uh, I mean, in your field of metaphysics, people have to find truth makers and so forth. But it's, but it's basically the policing function in philosophy is over. And that, that opened, opened things up. Nobody charges anybody in general. I mean, now and then, of course, people speak nonsense. But there's not some general criterion of meaningfulness or sayableness or knowability. Yeah, and one thing that struck me back in those, in the heyday of positive, positivism was um, the way in which, the way in which the po positivism was so dominant that, um, that many Christians had no idea how to, how to respond to it. Right. 
Uh, I remember one article in Mind where uh, um, I, I think a Christian philosopher, anybody, someone, at least someone interested in Christian philosophy and in, in philosophy as a Christian, was thinking about the positivist claim that um, a statement like God loves us or God has created the world, the positivist said, well, this is just meaningless. Right. So said the positivist. It doesn't conform to the verifiability criterion. And this person suggested that, well, I guess that's the way things so are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so we have to reinterpret these yep. statements. So to say that God created the world means something like um, uh, many, of, many of the features of the world redound to human flourishing. That's what it say, God created the world. And or take your pick. I'm struck with <laughs> awe sometimes when I see the Rockies or something Yeah, like that. something like that. And, and similar things of that sort, which, which strikes, and then at that time did strike me as, as insufficiently bold. I mean, Christians should have, they should have said, your criterion implies that uh, these statements are meaningless, um, but they're not, so I guess there's something wrong with your criterion, you know. Right. One sometimes gets the sense that in certain segments of the academy, naturalism plays this policing role that you talked about. It's not so in, in contemporary Anglo-American philosophy, um, but uh, in the sciences, uh, from, a, from a distance anyway, it seems that naturalism plays that kind of role. Uh, why do you think that would be? Why would naturalism be functioning that way in some segments of the academy and not, and not uh, philosophy? And yeah, not in philosophy. Um... Well, because it's not so easy to articulate. It's easier to talk about naturalism and to say I'm a naturalist and so forth than it is to explain just what it is to be a naturalist and that done to, to um, defend it against objections. So, so philosophers are more, <laughs> more cautious. They may, they may in fact be intuitive naturalists. A lot of them are, it seems, intuitive naturalists. But to stick your head up and articulate it and defend it, that's, that's not so easy. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.